Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a lot of the, um, the institute is involved in, in smoke taint work in, in a number of ways. Firstly, from, from our point of view, or the department that I lead, um, we are very much involved in um, interaction with winemakers. And when, wine, and wine, ooh, excuse me, when winemakers call us up and say, look, we've got this issue, then we are really obliged to respond, and that's obviously funded through the GWRDC. We also have, so a lot of the, the presentation which I will present now is really directed to winemakers. Um, and perhaps we've sort of looked at um, the management strategies that perhaps winemakers can use or, um, and also some of the information here sort of dispels some of the, some of the, some of the issues with smoke. Um, we also have a collaboration with Kerry Wilkinson from the Adelaide University. So um, some of this work sort of touches on, um, there's, so there's some overlap there, but um, in terms of what Kerry's doing also, but certainly Kerry will go into um, the research and the science um, um, much more than I will. Um, so we'll just start. So, so really what are the implications? Obviously we've already, um, from the two previous speakers, we've sort of talked about um, what's happened in the past and obviously you know, we're sort of seeing a trend upwards where um, a lot more fire events are actually happening in the future. Sorry, happening in the last few years and obviously they're going to uh, perhaps, the trends are, look, it looks as if they will probably accelerate in terms of how many events we have. And obviously it's all about climate change. Um, and obviously, um, you know, within between the now and the next perhaps generation, we'll see um, some people are saying there's all sorts of predictions out there. But you know, if we if we see a tripling of fire events over the next uh, 30 or 40 years, then that's probably um, that's one of the scenarios which uh, which are people are already looking at. Um, certainly, prescribed burning operations. Obviously, that's a whole field there. Um, the only thing I really want to say is that you know the industry and I think people who sort of look after our forests and our and our and our and our uh, wooded areas. Obviously, we really need to harmonise our approach, um, and obviously, it's going to be a lot more work in the future. Um, it's quite an interesting picture here. It's obviously, if you Google these things, you can probably find all sorts of interesting pictures. Um, looking from the northwest of Australia to the southeast, um, and this really, I actually show this picture to winemakers as well because some winemakers think, well, if there's a fire in the Brossa Valley and we're in McLaren Vale, then we're really not going to have an issue. Um, and obviously, you know, you can see there's sort of quite a lot of um, um, I guess the fires in 2003, we saw over four states plus the uh, Australian Capital Territory, four million hectares were burnt. Um, and it's quite interesting as well because southeastern Australia and California and also the Mediterranean regions, um, they are perhaps the most fire prone areas in, uh, in the world. And obviously we've seen um, in the last year we saw fires in Greece, a lot of people died, only about 70,000 hectares burnt. The fires in California last year were about 160,000 hectares, but they were they were caused in, um, in late October, obviously after the growing season, but obviously this year is certainly different. They're probably looking at a fire scenario very similar to 2003. So obviously they've, we've, had, we've, we've already fielded quite a few inquiries from people in California about what they should be doing, and what kind of information is out there. So it's quite, I guess it's heartening to see that they're actually coming to Australia to actually find out um, and we're actually taking a, a proactive role in, in dealing with smoke. Um, and so, like I said, there's, there's um, you know, in 2003 there was over 4 million hectares burnt, so obviously um, because we don't, I guess we don't have the, the, the population, obviously the built up areas, then our fires are perhaps going to be a lot more destructive, I think, and obviously that's where you're going to see a lot, a lot more smoke generation compared with California or other, other parts of the world. So what are we talking about here? Um, obviously, I'm not sure if everybody's sort of familiar, but I'll just go very quickly. Um, there's two compounds which are really identified, um, and these are very, very strong markers. Uh, guaracol and 4-methyl guaracol. A lot of the work was done in the Institute in 2003. Um, what they did at that stage is they uh, modified a, uh, a technique which was actually used for oak analysis and um, because obviously guaracol and 4-methyl guaracol is actually a um, very strong component in, um, in oak. Um, not only is it in oak but also it can be formed naturally as well. So in a Merlot juice which the Institute was involved with um, you can have um, natural levels of guaracol um, it's really nothing to do with, uh, with oak ageing, so you can get, depending, it can be less than five, it can be up to 20, uh, 20 micrograms per litre. Um, Guaracols also tend to be, it, on, its, on its own, actually can be quite interesting because it gives us some nice, nice spicy sort of aromatic notes. Um, and obviously when you look at some of the other things that you get through oak ageing, um, some of the uh, vanilla, some of the lactones, some, some of the burnt sugar and sort of toffee flavours can be actually quite, quite positive. So in a normally sort of oak age wine, you can have you know, reasonably, reasonably high levels. Um, what are the characters we're looking at? Um, obviously everybody's quite familiar with them. Um, it's actually quite interesting because um, 
we were, uh, I, was at a, I was at a wine show and we did a, um, um, a wine options dinner one night and we had to look some really, really old wines and one of these wines was actually quite smoke tainted and uh, it went back to the 1970s and a lot of the winemakers couldn't actually even pick up that character, they couldn't even determine it. So um, what we try and do in our tastings, we also try and show smoke tainted wines because obviously some winemakers still don't know what a smoke tainted wine looks like and it's actually quite concerning sometimes when you know, we actually see wines coming in and actually being bottled and then a winemaker says, oh, something's wrong with my wine, what is it? And you taste it and all of a sudden it's, you know, it looks quite smoke tainted and they haven't be, been able to pick that up. So um, if you see these wines like this, there's probably a chance that it is, that it is uh, smoke tainted. And the other effect is also, it's, it's not only what you sort of smell on the nose, but it's also what's on the palate. And on the palate can be quite metallic, quite hard, very persistent, very, um, very unattractive finish. And obviously in a combination with the sort of the guaiacol and sort of the volatile phenols that you get, and plus what you see on a palate, it really sort of makes that, and it gives that sort of really unique, um, really unpleasant smoke tainted character. Um, some of the sensory levels that winemakers have, um, have come back with, and obviously what's interesting is that, is that as, as the exposure, as, as people become more and more exposed, they become more and more sensitive. And so perhaps in 2003 when, um, you know, people were, um, not so observant, but now obviously when people see they become more and more observant, so um, it's good to see that, uh, you know, the, in terms of sensories, uh, they actually are dropping and people are becoming more and more observant and therefore taking remedial action. Um, red wines, it's obviously, um, some people were saying that, oh, my Pinot Noir is a lot more, um, um, it's a lot more, uh, can be affected by smoke taint more than my Cabernet. That's really not true, it's really a function of the style and the, uh, of the body of the wine. And so, for example, we had um, um, some wines from a vineyard last year where they had a, um, a Cabernet Sauvignon which had about 30 micrograms of guaiacol, and from the same vineyard they had a Shiraz which had about 40 micrograms, and the Cabernet actually looked a lot more tainted than the Shiraz. So it's really a function of the, uh, of the body and of the structure of the wine. Mm -hmm.